Yeah, hey, let's give it up for Katie. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, because, you know, wanting all the attention is exactly what Katie <laughs> didn't want. Please come back next week, Katie. Uh, well, with that, man, just kind of sitting in the back, and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm speechless for all the Lord is doing in this church on these Sunday mornings, but the other six days of the week, and that's what we've talked about, right? We're a seven days a week church. Um, having people use their giftings to bless the congregation, things that they never thought they would be doing, like being a part of the worship team. And yes, worship team, that's what you're doing. You're blessing the congregation, leading us through that worship. Um, seeing people do things, again, they're just like, oh, never in a million years would I have thought that I would do that. And man, if you really want to have your mind blown, say, Lord, I would never do this, right? I would never speak in front of somebody, or I would never be a part of the worship team. And he's like, really? That's fascinating. <laughs> Watch this. Um, I think of <clears throat> things like, so yesterday, uh, our River Valley as a whole had a um, men's, <clears throat> kind of a men's thing. We're launching this new men's ministry. Some campuses are already kind of doing it. We had a uh, hundred and something guys register. We were planning for 200. And I think over 210, 215 guys showed up just ready to... <clears throat> Yeah, be in arms with each other and fellowship with each other, eat amazing food. It was almost a loaves and fishes thing. Uh, and then simultaneously, women are gathering here in fellowship together. Oh, yeah, we're clapping. And then my favorite thing is to sit in the back and watch the Lisa and the three girls up here just dancing. Yeah, well... Yeah, Mila and Emmy were dancing, uh, but also the child whisperer Lisa is. I'm like, I haven't held Clara, like, she held her for like 15 minutes and Clara didn't budge. And I was like, I haven't done that for like a year, right? <laughs> like, what is she doing? Is she like threatening Clara? What is she whispering something? But not threatening. Um, yeah, Benadryl, yeah. Uh, just those things are happening at this church. And there's so many things that, uh, that I'm not aware of. Um, as I had said, and this big vision night we had as our whole church. So this church is, is churching, right? This church is, and what that means is that people are listening and they're faithful to what the Holy Spirit is doing through their life and they're doing it. Uh, and they're not just coming here uh, to get a word, to listen to worship, to drop money in the plate and then leave. They're here to, you guys are here to fellowship, to be a part of a family, as Laura said. And uh, I'm super excited. And so, so with that, the, the men's ministry and the women's ministry, every month, uh, ladies, you're meeting here on the second Saturday of every month at potentially 9.30, yes. unless the power goes out and it's a different time. Uh, men, we're going to be here on the third Saturday of every month at 9, because we like to be different. Um, and then the last Sunday of every month is just a family potluck, as we're all aware of. Um, so there's, those are some announcements I had. Uh, but now we are... Uh, I would say let's clap again, but we're done clapping. We're out of chapter seven, right? Which is, has been a really cool thing, uh, but we're into chapter eight. And um, I have a, a little story that, that I came upon uh, about somebody named Ralph, just to make sure we got no Ralphs in the, all right, because <laughs> Ralph's the antagonist in the story, and so I didn't want to upset anybody, no. So Ra Ralph grabs a guitar and a microphone 20, 20 minutes ago, and he would just not let them go. At first, everyone at the party was polite enough, maybe just a little too polite. And if you're starting to relate with Ralph, and this, it's okay. <laughs> We're here for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but now patience was wearing thin. They're sitting there saying, go tell him. No, you tell him. No, I can't tell him. You tell him. What am I supposed to say? Ralph, you're making a fool of yourself? He thinks he's really good. So everyone kept silent as Ralph continued to play and sing. Horrifying sounds came from his mouth. I am the Ralph in this situation, but I learned discernment early on that musical gifting was not my strong suit or suit at all. So he said he could not get a single tune right. None of his chords fit. It was all everyone could do to not laugh him out of the room. But Ralph goes on so full of himself, so confident of his musical talent that he thought he was the life of the party. Why are we bagging on Ralph? Well, because what Paul is highlighting here in chapter 8, he addresses that there's some Christians that are a lot like Ralph. They've learned a few things about Christian theology, but in their self-assurance and their pride, 
They've insisted that what they know is the exact truth, and that's all that mattered. They became so filled with spiritual pride that they lost sight of more important teachings, such as the responsibility to love God and to love and build up each other. Paul's not going to let this continue in which he drops chapter 8. And I even think of outside of musical town, I think of everybody that goes to college, I think, does this, right? You go to college, you get the 101 classes, the 202, you get a textbook, you read it. Now you know everything, right? If you're, if you're going to school to be a therapist, you're just di- diagnosing every single person. You're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. Uh, Rachel's family has a couple nurses, one that's been a nurse for two decades, one that's just becoming a nurse. And you kind of got to see that, the, the young nurse saying, this is what is wrong. And then the, the nurse that's been a nurse longer, like, not quite, right? But you're getting there. And I think we all have that ability to, when we learn something, right, our truth is the only truth, now, when it comes to the matters of God is the one true God, there are no other lowercase g's God above him, that is awesome. But sometimes it, it seeps into maybe the minors or some secondary teachings where we're burning people out of house and home because that we, they don't agree with what we're saying. So we're going to read uh, chapter 8. Coming out of chapter 7, he switches again. He's kind of doing this Q&A, you could say, uh, where... They had some questions posed for him. He's talked about it, right? What's your relationship look like? Marriage, uh, singleness. And now we have this uh, one regarding idols. And we're going to talk about idols uh, a little bit over the next uh, few months. So here we are. We're going to read all chapter 8 because it is not the longest chapter in the world. It says this, verse 1. Now about food, sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Keep in mind, knowledge was something that was really important to the Corinthians, right? They, they puffed themselves up. It was whoever knew the, the biggest words won. Whoever knew the most was the smartest. So he uses their, their words on them. He's now uh, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything... He does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So we all have knowledge, right? We all think we know everything, but, but if you have love, then you actually truly know God. And that's what's important. That's the primary focus. Verse 4, about eating food sacrificed to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from him and we exist for him. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him and we exist through him. However, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we are not better if we do eat. But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So a weak person, the brother or sister whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now when you sin like this against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never eat meat again so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. So he's saying some pretty interesting things here. Uh, And I I like how he compares that knowledge to that love. Again, as we as Christians, we all have knowledge. So a little context, as you guys know, I like to go context, and then basically two responses, our responses to idols and our responses to each other. So first, this context, we see... uh, we see this idea of eating the food kind of associated with idols uh, throughout the Old Testament. I think in Numbers 25, it says, while Israel was staying in the Acacia Grove, the people began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab. Women invited them to sacrifices for their gods, and then people ate and bowed down in worship to their gods. So you would worship 
gods, you would sacrifice food, and then that food would kind of get divvied up. It would get divvied up to the priests. It would get divvied up to other households, and then the markets. So uh, God followers, right, uh, Christians, they'd be constantly tempted with this meat, which to them was forbidden. Now, like I said, uh, idols, we're going to talk about more, I think, next month. Uh, but I, I don't want to go through this teaching without uh, sharing Paul's pretty powerful words on idols. And then we're going to kind of dissect what we mean by this strong, weak, knowledge, love. So chapter 10, verse 19, he says, What am I saying then? The food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But I do say that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to gods. I do not want you to think, uh, I do not want you to be participants with demons. So I think of it this way, when somebody makes an idol, it's nothing, right? It's a nothing, but it's a nothing that's being offered up to, to something. So he says, hey, stay away from idols. And that's, here's a spoiler alert. Uh, What do we do with idols? We're going to flee from them. But idols have no power in our life. That's the knowledge. That's the knowledge of the strong, is that these idols truly have no power. They are nothing. A little gold statue of a cow or a gold statue of me doing this has nothing. I could throw butter at it. I think that's what uh, some uh, Native American cultures used to do. They used to throw butter at these totem poles to earn favor. It's a waste of good butter, right? I could, I could give money to a golden statue, and it will never, ever do anything. That's the knowledge of understanding that I serve the one true God, this little statue is nothing. But we can't lack sensitivity towards Christians that are still struggling with this. And a lot of these were coming out of these cultures where that's what they knew. That's where they put everything into it. That that golden statue is everything. So again, knowledge was important to Corinthians. And so sure, as we like to compare ourselves. So when I think I've got it, when I understood that following Jesus is the correct thing and that I'm serving the one true God and that thing no, no longer has power over me, well, sure, I'm going to look at the guy that's struggling with that and be like, cool, I'm a super Christian. They're a weak Christian. Imagine, right? We have name tags. You have somebody at the door. All right, you're a strong Christian. Boom, gold tag. Uh, All right, you're a little weak. You had a weird week on Facebook. Boom, weak Christian. And we're wearing these name tags, right? And the strong are over on one side and the weak are over on the other. It's how you destroy a church. It's how you destroy a fellowship. But he's still using this language. But what I love, and I've shared this in other teachings, is that Paul is speaking with this expectation. He has an expectation for these strong, he uses the the we language. He has an expectation for the weak Christians as well. The Greek words for strong and weak can also be translated to powerful, the with knowledge, with the understanding, or powerless. And I'm going to get to that because when we operate out of fear, which is something that's been on, on in my heart, when we operate out of fear of these other things having control in our life, we become powerless. So the strong, right, they're strong in their faith, they're strong in their conscience. They had no concern about me or alcohol or the Sabbath, kind of Old Testament laws, traditions, right? They were powerful, they were well-connected, and they had a content. For the weak. But the weak, they were weak in faith and conscience. They were very concerned about those traditions. They were powerless. Oftentimes they were maybe social outcasts and they had condemnation for the strong. Another phrase we could use for the weak was that they were really legalistic. They were the kid coming out of the the 101 class in college with the textbook, right? To the letter of the law, that's what I'm going to hold you to. But Paul is really clear. He says, all right, knowledge. Some of you have knowledge. The strong Christians have this knowledge, this understanding. Good. But you can't operate without love as well. So these weeks, they were converts from pagan religions, and they just had trouble. And and kind of the, the stumbling, this idea, is that they believe, man, if I am going to eat meat that is sacrificed to the idols, then I am still participating in idolatry. Or if you are eating meat sacrificed to idols, you are participating in idolatry. And there was that freedom that the strong Christians had. And so a a few comparisons, right? The weak are still growing in their understanding of God's grace and the freedom that he has given us. This is something very true to us today. We have freedom in Christ. 
We have so much freedom, but, right? There's a big but. Well, not a big but, but, uh, ah. <laughs> but we still have to be sensitive to each other. Just because we can doesn't mean we should, while the strong are still growing in their understanding of God's grace towards each other. So the weak, this weak Christian, they're still trying to understand what God's freedom means. And the strong, who have a better grasp on that, still have to be extra sensitive towards each other. Can't have a church without each other. And a church where you're kicking out the so-called weak and you're keeping the strong is just a weird episode of Survivor, I think. That's not a true church. And eventually, if you have a bunch of strong that think they're the strongest, everyone else is going to become the weakest. So I read this quote. It said, knowledge is proud that it has learned so much, but wisdom is humble and that it knows no more. The knowledge is important, but the wisdom is more important as well as we go through life with each other. So our response to idols in our life. Again, uh, this is a lot more in chapter uh, 10. And we're going to be talking about that in about a month. But it is a very clear Verse, chapter 10, verse 14. So then, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Flee is a really powerful word. He didn't say meander. He didn't say slink away. He didn't say hang out with. Flee from idolatry. Because while an idol is a nothing, it's a nothing that is offered to something. It's giving something that should be to God. It's giving our worship. It's giving our adoration It's surrendering something that should go to God going to somewhere else. I think idols or or Satan using idols, he's attempting to steal and steer us away from God. And I think it's important to know our lives, we're either pointing towards God. You think a 360 degree, right? We're pointing towards God or we're pointing away from God. A lot of us think pointing away from God is doing the 180, but if you're over there, you're still pointing away from God. And I think these idols want us to do that. As we're Christians, we're going down this path, and Satan's like, man, if I can just kick you off a little bit, then I've done my job. If you can give your, your favor or, or your adoration to something else, a lowercase g even, I'll take that. You're going away from God. So he says very clear in chapter 10, Flee from idolatry. I was thinking of uh, a lot of the pastors, right? We're like, all right, what are these modern day versions of this? Because I, uh, I don't, especially this campus, we don't have a problem eating meat. We love uh, just to, to barbecue, smoke meats. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, after this afternoon, there's this, uh, this low-key football game going on, and I'm going to a party. Why? Not because my friend has a daughter that's Clara's age, but because he's smoking tri-tip, right? So we love meat. Not to digress, which I just did, but what does this mean? What are these things, essentially, uh, that with a, a strong Christian, so to speak, might have the knowledge to say, all right, this has no power, yet another believer is still working through it. Uh, our senior pastor, Mark Goins, he's uh, been in ministry just about as long as I've been alive. So he's, he has seen it, right? Uh, he's been at uh, River Valley when it was a, a pretty strong Baptist church 25 years ago, I think. And, but he's, he's been through the ranks of church, and he was talking about these things um, that used to cause division in the church, right? They used to cause people to stumble for their own personal convictions where you might say, hey, they were legalistic. Uh, playing pool and cards would not have been allowed. Playing pool, right? I, I, I I just, not allowed. Uh, interracial marriage, that was something historically that was a problem. Uh, dancing, right? Dancing. Uh, I, I don't know whether, just in general, there used to be this saying that was, uh, no, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, checking kids. It was, don't have sex because it leads to dancing, right? It was kind of that idea of like, that is taboo, that is of uh, the devil. Uh, moderate use of alcohol, Women's fashion, even something that might hit a little closer to home, but how and to what we, we worship or celebrate holidays. And there's that idea that there is a side, there's a trail that can take you to a really dark place, but if you have the knowledge and don't let it have that power over you, you get to operate in that freedom. 
There's some stories out there. There's some TV, I think of uh, Harry Potter, where there's uh, believers that can read that because they understand that this has no influence on me. But there's other believers that have convictions that say, this is, uh, maybe this is more sensitive to me. I'm not going to touch it. And I think what we do as a body where we can go wrong is where the two parties, they create factions and they shove their knowledge, their understanding down each other's throat. Where instead you operate with love and you listen and who knows, you might actually take something from the other. You might decide I'm not going to touch that either or, or, hey, I have this freedom. Again, he says knowledge is good, but man, that's not where we stop. Because if you just have knowledge, it's incomplete. But if you truly know God, that's where you'll be complete. That's where you feel the love. So to the strong... Freedom in Christ allows participation as long as we celebrate whatever we're doing in our freedom of Christ and not over our freedom of Christ. When those things become an idol over Christ, right? we have that freedom as long as we do it in our freedom of Christ, not over it. But for others that are still working through it, we have to be loving. And to the weak, we can't let fear have that power over us because fear is incredibly restricting in our lives. I, I didn't realize, but I've, I've been in a real big kind of the last 10 years, I think I've pulled back a lot of layers in my life and I didn't realize how controlled by fear I was. Now, I was a rule follower and I had a friend that was uh, not a rule follower and I think the fact that we were so different, it really just ramped him up to get me to not be a, a rule follower. But I remember, and there might be a purpose to this. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, so I was like 17. I think I was turning 18 in like a month. And he's like, come on, man, smoke a cigar, right? Because that's what we were cool, smoking cigars and drinking Pepsi. That's all he wanted to do, right? And I was like, no, I am not 18. And I just remember that was the hill I was dying on. We're on our driveway. Uh, he wants me to smoke this cigar. And I just, I wouldn't but because my resolve was pretty small, right? I eventually did, and I went, Poof, and I coughed because I didn't know what I was doing, and I threw it out of anger. I had such a visceral response to something that was, in fact, so minute, right? And I was a rule follower, but you know, no, no, nothing was going to die if I participated in that or I didn't. It was just a matter of I was uh, so afraid of what breaking that specific rule where no one would have known about it. I would have gone to the police station, I broke a rule, and they're like, you're wasting our time, right? I wouldn't have done that. But in bigger, a bigger scope, right, if we operate out of this fear, I'm totally forgetting about the grace that God brings us because I'm so controlled by the fear of the what if. And, and God said in there, what if? I had a grace that was so freeing of this fear that you are wrapped up in. What if you believe that? I'm not saying we can go break rules and cash in our forgiveness card, but again, it's understanding the bigger picture. So our response to idols is flee. And again, if, if uh, idol worship is something like, man, I really want us to hit on this harder, we are absolutely going to. But, but we, we, we got to flee from idol worship because it's offering uh, nothing to something. And we can't let that go over our worship of Christ but I want to spend the last few minutes of uh, Paul's words in chapter 8 about our response to each other, our response to the fellowship. And I was reading, and there was this question, was, are you, to the fellow believer, are you a stumbling block or are you a rock? Are you a stumbling block or are you something that somebody can lean on? Are you someone that somebody can lean on? And you think of a stumbling block, that word specifically that's used is a stone and a pathway. It's an obstacle. It's something that trips one up and makes progress difficult. The commentary says the actions of the strong must never be such as to offer a hindrance to the progress of the weak. Now you hear stumbling back, oh man, I never want to. But then you take those words and, and you ask yourself, think of a, maybe a new believer or someone who's not yet a believer. And they say, man, when it comes to their journey of truly knowing who God is, Am I somebody that they can go to for support? Can I build them up? Or am I literally something that trips them up and makes their progress difficult? 
right? When I go up to the Lord, when I die, I don't want to be like, man, people would have came to me a lot quicker if you just closed your mouth and got out of the way. I don't want that at all, right? I don't want to make someone's progress difficult to the Lord. So I have a few, uh, <laughs> a few verses. It happens. I'm growing because normally I'd be like, no, 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 let it play. What was what's it saying? It's a message from the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Was they talking about the game or what? No. So, so a few verses for you, right, in our, our response to each other. Galatians 5.13 says, For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. There, it's clear. And the, the, the phrase that's been in my head when I think of a strong Christian using their knowledge to uh, belittle somebody weaker in the faith, or as it says, to satisfy my, my sinful nature, it's like that na-na-na-na boo-boo, right? Like what he's saying specifically with the meat is like, hey, if John has chosen, he, he can't quite participate in meat sacrifice to idols, what I don't do is take my steak and be like, oh yeah, right? na 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 boo-boo, this is really good. Do you want some? No, I made two, one for you, but you can't have it. Now I get both of them. That's what we don't do, right? But man, isn't that our personal sinful nature? Because we just love being able to be compared to somebody and coming out shinier. He's saying, just don't do that. Very clear. Use your freedom for other people to serve them and love. It is by what that, we, that people will know that we are Jesus' disciples. Not my ability to consume meat. Not my ability to be smart. But my, my love for other people to come along somebody and say, all right. I'm going to humble myself. My knowledge is not important here, but love is. I think of Jesus himself, or it says, God humbled himself, became a man through Jesus. Didn't stop there, but he actually then died for us. And we're to follow suit, to serve one another in love. Romans uh, 15, and this, we're going to kind of use this to, uh, the title of my notes, which I have not referenced once, is this idea of being a strong church. And it kind of comes from this, this section in uh, Romans 15, and that's what I want us to continue to be is a strong church. Not that we're just puffed up with our knowledge, but we're actually serving one another in love. And I think of Romans 15, verse 4 through 6. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to to Christ Jesus. So there's a few things that I want us as this idea of a, a strong church. Three to five, I have words on mine. I don't know how many of them are going to come out in what order. But if I think of us being a strong church, we're going to do a few things. One, we're going to build each other up. There's no particular order, but three things I want to see. Uh, and that's happening through encouragement and support. We're going to build each other up. I think the really cool thing about these men's and women's ministries that are happening, and I think so many things are going to blossom up, is because we see each other, right? We're, we're chatting with each other on a Sunday. We'll talk over a cup of coffee. But man, you think of when the good conversation happens. It, it, it happens when it's more one-on-one -on -one or there's three or four of you. I think if Shane came over one time to help me with uh, uh, tiles in my, my shower, and we had talked a little bit in the lobby. But man, we had that time about an hour or two. Heard his testimony, heard his story. He heard some things from me. We got to talk. We got to know each other more in depth. And what I like about these smaller groups, what I love about life groups, what I love is about, about more than just a high and buy, but exchanging numbers and going to get lunch together is because then you get to hear where we are struggling. Man, I just thought you were so well put together. You come in here, you're all smiling all the time, but you're a wreck just like me. All right, let's, right? We all need to know that we're all just wrecks like each other. But we can be rocks for each other as well, and we can encourage and we can support. What I love about encouraging is building up. It doesn't mean flatter, right? It doesn't mean looking at you and saying, hey, you're a mess, but let's not pretend you're a mess. But it's actually like building each other up, creating supports, helping you go from, all right, I am a mess. How do I become an un-mess, so to speak? 
So to be a strong church, we're encouraging and we're supporting, we're fortifying each other. Build each other up. As Romans 15 says, though, this is of utmost importance. We study the word. We study the word here. We study the word on our own through our Bible plan. We study the word in groups. We are students of the word of God because it is the word of God. It is here for our instruction. It is here to give us hope and endurance. So we study the word. We will always be students of the word here in, in our church, in our life groups, in our fellowship, in our daily lives. We are students of the word. And lastly, and uh, the team can kind of uh, make their way back up, but a strong church is going to constantly show and have hope for the future. I think hope is a really important thing in our life right now is, uh, as you turn on the news in the morning, you have a reason to be, uh, a temptation to be afraid. There's potential for fear. Some of you are going to go and you're going to watch this unimportant football game and eat good food and there's going to be commercials and you're just going to grieve because they're pushing some sort of agenda. A lot of things in this world that just kind of want to uh, take us down. But we as a church, as we show Jesus to each other, as we study Jesus together, as we get to know Jesus in our own personal lives, we have to continue to have this hope for the future, for our hope with our future, for Jesus, the hope for the future of this church. Newsflash, in 60 years, 50 years, I don't know, maybe one or two people in this building are going to be here in this church. This church is going to go beyond us. It's going to go beyond every single person in this room. We need to continue to give hope to our younger generations. And that hope ultimately is found in Jesus, and that is the anchor of a strong church. Let's pray. Lord, it's you and only you that our hope is found. And Lord, it's that hope that we live in. It's that hope that we just share with each other, that we celebrate. Like the girls were doing, it's what we dance in. It's your hope. It's, it's the grace and the mercy that you bring us. On our own, we are nothing. The knowledge we have is nothing without the love that we receive from you and the grace and the mercy that we receive from you. And I pray that as we interact with other people, it's that grace and that mercy and that hope that they experience over the puffed up knowledge. We celebrate our freedom in you, Lord, and, and we commit the rest of this time uh, to you. And we say all this in your name. Amen.